I can have your attention once again. It's my pleasure to announce our final keynote speaker for this conference, Professor Ioannis Papadopoulos, who was recently elected full professor of political and legal philosophy and European policies at the Department of International and European Studies at, of the University of Macedonia in Thessaloniki. And he is also the director of the Center for Research on Democracy and Law at the same university. And he has a primary research interest on matters of law and religion, which will be related to the subject of his lecture today. Okay. The floor is uh, yours. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. I have to say that I'm very honored to have been invited by the University of Belgrade uh, Faculty of Law. It's my first time here. I'm so thrilled also to be in Belgrade, this uh, fantastic city. And of course, I'm happy to be with you and share my thoughts. I have to warn you, though, that this is my first incursion into Hebrew territory. I found a world that is very rich, and I intend to stay there, to camp there for a while. But I, you know, I would like to ask for your indulgence because I'm not a historian. I am, though, a lawyer, and as you might heard, I might have heard, I am a you know political and legal philosopher. So we're going to talk about the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, more specifically, the Torah. The world of the Hebrew Bible is not a world imbued with magic, with cosmological awe. There's no sacredness in the sun or the moon, no magical aura in nature, no healing power in the touch of kings, none of this. We cannot find mythological wonders or lyrical exaltations in front of the mysteries of the universe. The only true driving force of the Bible is the praise of the glory and sanctity of Yahweh, who, of course, is Israel's unique, transcendent, and eternal God. So contrary to the natural and cosmological religions of the surrounding, surrounding pagan populations and their tendency towards mystical and timeless contemplation, Israelite theology that we will talk about today is all about the history and the eschatological, we'll come back to that, promise of salvation. As revealed by God to his chosen people of Israel and sealed with a bilateral covenant, an alliance. We'll talk a lot about covenants. Israel's religion has to do with historical events formed by faith, by the faith in a caring God and with fidelity to his salvation plan for humankind that will hopefully lead to the establishment of his kingdom on earth at the Eskata. Eskata is the end of time, of course. There's really no political theory in the Bible. That is quite astonishing, but the Bible has a lot to say on matters of religious faith, of personal social morality, but is agnostic on politics. Indeed, it often shows an anti-political tendency, since it is not interested in the construction of an ideal political community or in the management of day-to-day -day affairs. The writers of the Bible only care about personal histories as a way of educating the people in God's law, law and, and morally orienting them in their life. As a result, the constitutional arrangements that are sketched, notably in Deuteronomy chapter 17, 18, are, I would say, rudimentary. They just mention the institutional figures of kings, judges, prophets, and scribes, and uh, with slim elements as to their functions. It's very slim. Now, rules of entitlement and succession in positions of political authority and the exercise and rules on the exercise of political power more generally are extremely scarce. And to the extent that we can trace them, it's quite difficult to trace them, they are clearly predetermined in their orientation by the theological assumptions of Israel's fundamental religious belief in a unique and loving God who has offered his divine law to be followed by his chosen people. Now, it's, as it so happens, and this is the title, of course, of my conference, the Bible is replete with narratives of disruption in the legitimate order of succession of rulers. In a world imbued with tradition, where formal or informal patriarchal rules of succession are a template for the continuity and stability of sovereignty and existential threats from the outside, the numerous biblical instances of discontinuity in the form of reversal of fortune are striking. Hermeneutically, it is certainly meaningful to observe the repetition of such a theme in several narratives of the Old Testament. 
As Michael Walter uh, writes in his seminal book, In the Shadow of God, it's a great book, the Bible is a fascinating account of what is today called regime change. There are plenty of regime changes in the Bible. First one, of course, is the Egyptian tyranny of Pharaoh, which gives way to the leadership of Moses and then Joshua. Afterwards, this is followed by the intermittent rule, intermittent, excuse me, rule of the charismatic warriors called Judges, the book of Judges, which is rejected by the elders. We'll come back to the elders and their role and the people of Israel in front of the existential danger of military conquest by the Philistines and their demand to be ruled by kings who the kings are overthrown centuries later, as you might know, first in Samaria by the Assyrians in 722 BCE, and then for good in Judah by Babylonians in 597 BCE, and were replaced by foreign emperors and their priestly collaborators. So in my speech, I will focus on the period of the monarchy, of kingship, covered mostly by the so-called historic books, the two books of Samuel, I have them here printed out, uh, and the two books of Kings, 1 uh, Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, and the frequent overturning of the normal or legitimate state of affairs regarding succession, either by some younger brother, this is a current topic, doing away with the rule of male primogeniture, or by another type of what we might call a normative outsider. I will also talk about a more generalized detachment vis-a-vis -vis the secular powers that be, you know, the secular authority, by the key figure of the prophets. The prophets also play a key role, who open, the prophets I mean, a space of dubiety and potentially even of dispute as to the morality of the kings, and eventually also as to the normative force of the ground rules ensuring continuity in the exercise of the king's sovereignty. In the Bible, this disruptive potentiality is quite clearly the doing of divine intervention, which is a paradox for human reason if you come to think of it, because the preconditions and fundamental rules for the exercise of sovereignty are generally attributed to God, right? To God's will, but it is also God's will, mysterious will, to sometimes disrupt the normal succession of events leading to the establishment of a new ruler for the community and consequently to reinforce political legitimacy by sort of rejuvenating its physical incarnation. Now, everything starts with a permanent choice of Israel by Yahweh, who's God, as his people, his chosen people. This is a totally free choice of God that opens the history of salvation through a covenant of law. The word here is very important, it's Berit, at Mount Sinai, as you all might know, which const constitutes the people of Israel as a distinct religious and political community and binds this, the fate of this people with the law revealed by Yahweh. There have been several covenants in the history of Israel. First one dates back to Abraham, the part patriarch, but the covenant at Sinai is the most important one. Surely here we're not witnessing the making of a classical contract. That's why we don't translate better with contract, rather with covenant. Why? Well, because there is no room for negotiations in the first place. I mean, what kind of contract is this? And second, the covenanting partners, I mean, on the one hand, you have Yahweh. The other hand, you have the people of Israel gathered at the foot of the mountain. Well, they're definitely not equals. So the covenant is just a purely, I would say, gratuitous offering by God. And I would put it bluntly, a take it or leave it commitment, right? Still, still, its most important element is that of the free and equal consent of all the members of the community. That's what makes it covenant and just not just an order or commandment. The divine law ensuing from the covenant, you know, the Decalogue and all that, is only binding because it has been freely accepted by the people. And that presupposes, of course, full knowledge and the possibility of refusal. There might have been some folks who just, you know, bye-bye, went away, right? Okay. The covenant is not passed between God and Moses. That is something that's kind of a mistake, generalized mistake. No, it's not Moses as a representative of the people who passes the covenant. It is passed between God and each and every Israelite. Thus, even though Israel is constituted as a vassal nation, under God's sovereignty, the real God as we will see, the real king is God, the contracting of legal obligations is done collectively and binds everyone equally. 
This is why the biblical covenant has served as a model for the modern 17th century theory of social contract. You can trace it there. Indeed, the covenantal tradition is so strong in Hebrew religious and political culture that the covenant is renewed again and again in time. Each time the leaders of Israel need the agreement of the people, agreement of the people at critical junctures, such as when radically new policies are envisaged or when religious reform is thought to be necessary. We'll see later, we'll talk about the Davidic covenant. Now, this is the basic historical event, and this event has, I think, three profound and interrelated political implications that I think are of immense importance to our subject. The first major implication is that the moral righteousness of the law, the law stemming from the covenant, right, is not, I repeat, is not a matter of ruling elites, but it is a matter for every single person however obtuse or even illiterate that person might be, that Israelite might be. Why? Because the covenant was accepted as a matter of common knowledge by everyone, as we said, because of its intrinsic goodness, the, the goodness of its content. This practically means that the avoidance of covenant violations, and more generally of wickedness, of injustice, right, is not an obligation of leaders alone, but of the whole nation instead. In that sense, I would say, I would go so far as saying that the moral law ordained by the sovereign God is radically democratized. In the case of Israel, I will not hesitate a second to talk about a moral democracy. Now, the second main implication I find from the covenantal tradition is that the acceptance of the covenant by the chosen people is accompanied by the notion of service, ebed as its corollary. Israel's chosenness, followed by the solemn reading of the covenant by Moses and its acceptance by the Israelite community, mean that both the people and its kings in particular are meant to serve. To serve who? To serve God's law, of course, as enshrined in the covenant. Later on in history, the choice of the people will be accompanied by the choice of its king, who is always a Bashir. Bashir means chosen. Starting, of course, with David, as we will see, the first great kings in the line of Hebrew kings. So in this understanding, kings are clearly servants of God. This necessarily means that they have a mission to accomplish. They have in French a feuille de route, which means that the servant, king, and of course the people as servants also, must love Yahweh, must commit himself to him by continuously following his law, and must fear him. So the king is a vicar is a mandatory of God. That's his role. It's quite limited, as we will see. And the third major implication of covenantal religion is that it provides the background for the appearance of the prophet as a key figure, the second key figure of Israel, next to that of the king, in his critical function as censor, moral censor, as we will see. Censor of whom? Both of the earthly powers, the powers that be, most importantly, of course, kings, but also judges and priests, Prophets are very vehement against judges and priests, and of the people themselves, of course. Okay, so the prophets, these, I would say, fantastic and truly original spiritual figures, just pop up in Israel as moral authorities and censors of the king's reign, as living reminders of the obligations already binding on both the rulers and the people, inasmuch as they stem from the covenant. So the prophet's voice is the word of God in Bible, the Bible, that should be listened to according to the Deuteronomy. If the prophet accuses the people and its rulers for not loving Yahweh with all their heart and all their force, and for disobeying him, Israel's chosenness will quickly turn into divine judgment and collective punishment, since the whole nation is, as I remind you, responsible vis-a-vis -vis Yahweh, and not just its kings or other officials. The prophets had constantly been fighting against the tendency towards the legalization, the institutionalization of the covenant from the time of the concomitant establishment of the monarchy and of the state, because the monarchy and the state appear at the same time. Actually, the state is the monarchy. Why? Because such an institutionalized, legalized covenant would carry a grave risk, the risk in the eyes of the prophets of its transformation into a legalistic document threatening to obscure the religious event 
itself of divine revelation and the eschatological meaning of the history of salvation. Thus, it is prophecy, I would say, that maintains the covenant as both the foundation and the goal of the nation's life in its entirety. It is the prophets that do not allow for closure of the Israeli state to itself in a sort of self-sustained closed system. They keep it open, system of rules. And that always opens the eschatological hopefulness in a perfect union between God and his people, at the eschata, eventually all the peoples in the kingdom to come. Now, if we now delve into the pedigree a little bit of biblical law, we will realize that, as Martin Knott, a great German uh, theologist, said, we know we're here of the law-giving activity of the kings. This is very accurate. Israel's law is just God's alone. It belongs to God. It isn't the king's law. One of the upshots, as we saw, of covenantal religion is that everyone is equally subject to the authority and the commandments of the law. In all the Old Testament's historical books, I haven't been able, and because there is none, to find even a single line on the legislative capacity of the kings. Kings don't legislate, which I suppose I'm not a historian, but it should have come as a shock to the other peoples of the Orient. What do you have a king who doesn't legislate? I mean, well, okay. Israeli kings can't even change the law, can't modify the law. They just can trample on it or even break it violently. They often do, actually. But they cannot leave their stamp on the law. As Walter Perspicaciously observes, the distinctive future of Israelite law is its radical embeddedness in a historical narrative, which only stretches from the exodus from Egypt to the eve of the invasion of Canaan, the, you know, the promised land. And thus kings play no part in it because Israeli kingdom came later. So there is no part in salvation for kings. Thus, I would say that it's not surprising that kings are not among the interpreters of the law, acknowledged or unacknowledged interpreters, secret interpreters of the law, as are the prophets, the priests, the judges, the scribes, yes, all the others, they all, the others, I mean, can engage in the hermeneutic endeavor of arguing about and reinterpreting the law to fit the circumstances. For our purposes, it is very important to observe that Israeli kings are constitutionally, I would say, naked as to legislative power. They detain judicial, of course, power and executive, of course, power. They, I mean, mostly, mainly military and secondarily diplomatic power. But they are totally impotent as to the production of new laws because they're bound by their sacred mission as vicars of the one and only king, the only true king and legislator, El Majesty of Israel, which means, of course, God. Now, more generally, the Bible contains many justified laws. That's another fantastic thing. What do I mean by justified laws? The laws that aim to persuade as to their righteousness. There's no such thing as legal positivism in the Bible. We, you know, jurists understand what I mean. There's no, like, gazettes, it's gazettes, the law is the law kind of thing. Because God is not your classical legislator deploying, you know, sovereign power regularly, publicly. Okay, we've been taught all this. Despite his omnipotence, God usually works in mysterious, irregular, and invisible ways. And his authority is effectively taken up by the elites of the law, as we saw. Prophets, judges, priests, scribes, not the king himself. In any case, in Israel, interpretive debate about the justification of the law has always been vivid. Justified laws, or laws with reasons, as Walter calls them beautifully, certainly presuppose what? A notion of justification, an intuitive stance on justice. And this moral intuition originates, once again, from Israel's history of salvation. The narrative of the Hebrew slave's deliverance from Egyptian bondage is so strong in this culture that numerous legal texts recognize the special force of the community's obligations towards the legally and economically weak, meaning the poor, and towards all those who didn't enjoy the protection of a family, meaning widows, orphans, and resident aliens, aliens who have the right to be in Israel. And of course, logically exhort the king to offer protection to these categories of persons, not because of noblesse oblige, as is the case of the other kings of the Orient, the Assyrians, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, uh, uh, later, of course, the Persian tyrants. No, no, no. But because of the common, as we saw, religiously democratized experience of oppression, 
by the Egyptian and later, of course, the Assyrian, Babylonian, and the others, tyrants. I'll just quote from the beautiful King James Version of, of the Bible. Thou shalt open thine hand wide unto thy brother, to thy poor, and to thy needy in thy land. It's as clear as it can be. Not only is the law pluralized by the piling up of interpretive layers, as we saw in diverse legal codes and the original divine legislation, but it's also constantly held internally, I mean, in check by an anti-authoritarian and justice-oriented moral tropism. This is most probably, I think, the reason for Israel's blatant incapacity to produce and handle formal legislation on what on acquiring, maintaining, and transmitting political power through succession. There's nothing like that. What is important about political power, I'll be more clear, for this particular tradition, is definitely not to aim at legal security by establishing a succession line of rulers through clear constitutional rules. That's not what is important. What is important is the moral consistency of the rulers and the people's behavior with divinely revealed and, of course, humanly interpreted law. Now, let's go to our friends, the Hebrew kings, or at least some of them, because there are too many of them, and there's not time for all. I will just make a short historical account of kingship in Israel, as, uh, and also its theological and political ramifications. The history of Israel begins as family history. I mean, a set of family histories of the patriarchs, right? Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and so on then shifts to a history of a people, a political and religious community, following the exodus from Egyptian oppression and the covenant at Sinai. And then it goes back, shifts back to families. Only this time now families are dynasties, or would be dynasties in some cases, and the usual conflicts for birthrights, inheritance, now appear in the form of a struggle for royal succession, in a context, I remind you, lacking formal constitutional rules. At this point, it is important to keep in mind the basic arrangements of family, inheritance, and estate law in Israel. The basic rule seems to be male primogeniture. I referred to that before. The eldest son uh, enjoyed certain privileges, according to the law in Deuteronomy, such as becoming the head of the family and receiving a double part of the estate at the death of the father. Nonetheless, the eldest that's quite shocking, could lose his right of primogeniture, according to the law always, in a case of a grave tort. For instance, this Reuben guy in Genesis 35, uh, he practiced incest, which was not okay, and he lost his primogeniture um, right, and even had the right, that's even more shocking, to sell this right to a sibling. That's the famous case of Ezo, who sold his rights to Jacob, who was the chosen, the loved one by God. More importantly, a recurring theme across the Old Testament is that of the youngest brother supplanting the eldest who has the right of primogeniture. Here we have plenty of examples. Isaac inherits instead of Ishmael. Joseph is the preferred son of his father. And during the period of monarchy that is of interest to us, David, that's the great example, becomes king, the first great king, despite being the youngest of eight sons of Jesse, and he also transmits his kingship to his youngest son, Solomon. So the two greatest kings are definitely a violation of the rule. So the gratuitousness of God's choices is too striking not to be noticed as a dissenting pattern in the ground rule of male primogeniture. Let's go to Canaan. Canaan was divided into small city-states when the Israelites came in and conquered the land. In these small kingdoms, the dynastic, dynastic principle regulated the succession to the throne. The same applied to the first neighboring nation-states around Israel, namely Edomites, Moabites, Arameans, several of these people. Yet even though Israel was influenced by all these people, by the Canaanite kingdoms and by the nation states that are neighbors, especially in matters of religion due to widespread syncretism with the pagan cult of Baal and Astarte, kingship was definitely not and never really became implanted in Israeli culture. Indeed, we can even talk about an anti-monarchic tradition that can be traced back once, once again to the Egyptian oppression. After all, wasn't Pharaoh a king and the escape from Egypt, the liberation from royal oppression. 
So there's a strong anti-monarchical tendency from the beginning. The contest of kingship has a precedent, nice precedent in the book of Judges. During this period, before the kings, before kingship, when I quote, uh, there was no king in Israel and every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Nice. Okay. Uh, the men of Israel came to the great warrior Gideon, or Gideon, who had just won a war against the Midianites and proposed to him to become their king and also to establish this dynasty. But Gideon's response left him, I would say, cold turkey. That's the quote. I will not rule over you. Neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Well, uh, okay. The idea here is, of course, that God's rule is incomparably better than the rule of kings. I can baptize this direct theocracy. And this idea keeps reappearing throughout Israel's history. Now, what abruptly changed the mood and brought about the end of this loose confederacy and fictiony of Israel's 12 tribes of the intermittent and charismatic rule of judges, judges were simply war heroes raised by God, as the Bible says, was, of course, the existential danger represented by the Philistines. The Philistine military victories deep into the hill country that the Israelites had conquered two centuries earlier, together with the disunity of these tribes, and even sometimes a civil war among Israel's tribes, eventually paved the way to the establishment of the monarchy and the ipso facto of the state, of a true state. So I will recount the ultra-important story of the accession of the first and failed, this is important, the first king is a failed king, King Saul, right, Saul or Saul uh, to the throne, just a little bit later. At this point, I would like to say that according to the first book of Samuel, it is the elders, which means the informal representatives of the people who energetically demanded a king to prophet Samuel to judge us like all other nations. We would like to be like all the other nations. Why? Because all the other nations had king, kings as commanders-in-chief uh, of organized armies. And the people acclaimed the charismatic soul as king. And this element of popular acceptance, I'll come back to that, is important, and I will analyze it. So, the elders call for a king because they're afraid of the Philistines. And the fruit of this call is the institutionalization and the political routinization of charismatic rule. So comes the first king. Still under Saul, the royal institution remained in a sort of embryonic state because apart from its military role, we really don't know, there's nothing in the Bible, what else it is that the king did. There's nothing. More importantly, I would say, despite the disruption represented by the birth of kingship in Israel, despite the anti-monarchy tradition, we said, the dynastic principle is never admitted. Why? Because it is clear that nothing here is settled as to the succession of Saul in the so-called king's law that Samuel wrote for the attention of the freshly crowned king and gave it to him to sleep on it, right, to read it every day. There's nothing about that. So the continuity of the kingdom remained at the behest of the charismatic rule, which is another way of saying that it remained with God's mysterious ways. Man who would rise up by God as a being a charismatic ruler. This constitutional chapter of Deuteronomy, chapter 17, I have it here, which is important, contains a rather light regulation of kingship, and I think it nicely resumes this distinct Israeli conception of a very limited monarchy. I'll just read out a couple of passages, but he, I mean the king, shall not multiply horses to himself, neither shall he multiply, I'm afraid to say, wives to himself, neither shall he greatly multiply to himself silver and gold. Why? As we said, justified laws, laws of reasons, that his heart be not lifted above his brethren, his brother. So he should not be superior to his brother. So the, the idea is, is that the king is not to self-aggrandize by expanding his household, by increasing his power, or wealth beyond what is absolutely necessary for the performance of his mission uh, of loyalty to God's law and of the salvation of the people, military salvation. As we saw, the king is only a vicar, a mandatory of God. So Israel's king has no dignity, actually. has no cosmological dignity, has no aura, has, I would say, no significance apart from, you know, the uh, 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 doing the job in an American way. You know, it has, the, the king has meant to fulfill a practical and instrumental function. It's not, I mean, he's nothing like the pharaohs or the Babylonian rulers. 
So kings are morally equal to all other Israelites in the guise of God. And of course, kings remain legitimate to the extent that, and only so long as, they maintain their fidelity to divine law and to a, I would say, double covenant. First covenant, of course, the indissoluble association between Yahweh and his people from Sinai. And the second covenant um, is, of course, the ensuing implicit association between the king and himself, and the people, excuse me, kings himself, I mean and the people, which is, of course, the adage, salus populi suprema lex, let the salvation of the people be the supreme law. And as we will see, even though the emergence of the great King David, who see it in a while, who was, of course, the archetype of the God-loving and virtuous kingship, seemed for a while to change things by imposing his dynasty, his Davidic dynasty. In the final analysis, the monarchy and its concern for dynastic continuity remained, I would say, an adjunct element, not even an external element in Israeli history, so much so that the post-exilic community in the 5th century BCE got rid of it easily and once and for all. There was no king afterwards, ever. No wonder about that, because the Israeli king is not the warrant of the cosmological order. The Israeli king is just a uh, political artifact meant to fulfill a specific function. So he can be disputed, and he is actually <laughs> quite frequently disputed in himself, in his kingship, and in his posterity when he doesn't keep up with the mission he has in the course of historical events. So you can see all from this that the road for the modern social contract theory, starting with John Locke, it's all in the Bible. Everything is there. Now, the story of the beginning of monarchy in Israel is recounted in this beautiful book I have here, First Samuel. God had promised to someone, Samuel's mother, Anne, that her boy, Samuel, would anoint the future king that God would choose for his people. That was a prophecy by God himself. And that he would walk before his anointed forever. All Israel had recognized that Samuel was established to be a prophet of the Lord. So Samuel was the first prophet in the line of prophets. After the adventure, sad and amusing at the same time, adventure of the rapine of Yahweh's arch by the Philistines and its miraculous return back home to Israel, the elders of Israel got scared and they gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and to Ramah, the city of Samuel. There the elders pronounced their famous request to Samuel, make us a king to judge us like all the nations and to lead Israel to the battle. But the prophet Samuel apparently didn't like what he was hearing by the elders. Why? Because, well, he tried to talk them out of this crazy idea to, you know, to establish a king by warning them that the king will do horrible things. Hold your horses. They'll take their sons and appoint them to be his horsemen. They will reap your harvest. I mean, he, excuse me, the king will reap your harvest. He will make your sons instruments of war. He will take your daughters to be cooks and bakers. And worse, even worse, yes, I can tell you, the king will never hesitate to tax your seed for his own benefit. And he will seize your best fields, your, your vineyards, your old yards, the lot. In short, I quote, nice quote from 1 Samuel 8, 17, Ye shall be you, I mean, yeah, you, you, you people shall be his servants, which is surely not a very enviable future. But despite all the effort that Samuel <laughs> deployed to talk them out of this crazy idea, the people refused to hear the warnings of old Samuel because they were too afraid of the external enemy, the Philistines, roaming around Israel. So they pronounced the fateful words, Nay, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. That was the end of the affair. What about the Lord in all this, Yahweh? What is he doing? I mean, is he... Okay with this? I mean, he is, after all, the only king over Israel. Well, Yahweh himself listened to this. He heard the voice of the elders, the cry of the people, and sympathized with them for love of his people. So he then told Samuel, the astonishing, hearken unto, which means hear, hear their voice and make them a king. For they have not rejected thee, Samuel, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them gives me the creeps. This initial act of Israeli kingdom, I mean, definitely didn't start out well, and I'm afraid to say it didn't end that well either. 
So Yahweh told his prophet Samuel that he would send him a man out of the land of Benjamin to anoint this king over Israel, that he may save his people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry is come unto me, my ears. That's God speaking, right? Yahweh, I'm afraid, I'm, you know, I'm afraid to say he grew soft on the complaints of the people by pure love for them. And so he authorized an action that would later on lead to failure. That's what happened when you become sentimental, right? Well, okay, that happened also to God. So when Samuel saw the good-looking and very tall soul, appearances, unfortunately, deceive, God told him that he, the youngest son of Jesse and a modest shepherd, was the chosen one. So Samuel went on and anointed the youngster by pouring oil upon his head. And God's spirit, the famous Ruah, came upon Saul, and God gave him another heart. So this is a sacred thing. It became God by uh, anointment. The curious thing is that Saul's anointment by Samuel, which is a quintessentially sacred moment, was done in private, almost in secret, in a conspirational kind of mood. No celebrations, nothing. After which Samuel summoned once again the people unto the Lord in Mitzpeh, and there is a place, and there he announced to all that this was the man that God has chosen. And all the people shouted and said, God save this king. Now the great Jewish theologian and philosopher Martin Buber perceived very nicely that this procedure was certainly not a proper and complete coronation. There's something missing. There's something left undone. What is it? Well, it is the proof that he can do the job. He can fulfill his mandate that he has the military capacities of the king. So let's go on with it. Deliver on your mandate, man. Saul defeated the Ammonites and officially announced that today the Lord hath wrought salvation in Israel. And then Samuel summoned for the third consecutive time the people to Gilgal, where the people made Samuel king before the Lord and then made sacrifices and rejoiced greatly. So Saul had passed the Salus Populi test, and the people in the last resort had established him as a king. Three times the people convinced. It didn't take them long to change their minds, though. In a sort of after-sales sermon, if I may say so, Samuel chastised the still-assembled people in Gilgal. They were still there. We don't know where, Samuel, where Saul is. He just disappeared somewhere in the scenery. And he chastised them for having asked for a king and for not having contented themselves with Yahweh as their sole ruler. Listen to these words. And all the people said unto Samuel, Pray for thy servants unto the Lord thy God, that we die not. Please don't let us die. Why? For we have added unto all our sins this evil to ask us a king. That was quick. <laughs> that was very quick. He changed their minds just an hour afterwards. Okay, and... Poor Samuel said, soothe the ungrateful people by saying to them, fear not, for the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it hath pleased the Lord to make you his people. So the Lord is the one who actually authorized me to anoint Saul. Provided, of course, that you keep on the righteous path, otherwise you shall be consumed. You will die horribly, right? Both you and your king. That's Samuel speaking. Well, it is quite clear from all this that the king himself in his person and kingship as an institution and the kingship institution are, of course, God-fearing and life-saving salus populi devices, but I'm afraid they're on parole from their inception, from day one. You know, parole, be nice. And in fact, it doesn't take so long either to be brutally disinvested by Samuel himself, who Samuel, I remind you, is the author and keeper of the king's law, the manner of the kingdom, which means the conditionality of the kingship's mission. Let's just read King James' version of chapter 13 of 1 Samuel. The, you know, the title says, Saul offers a burnt offering, which was a terrible mistake. The Lord, don't ask why, the Lord rejects him and chooses another captain. Notice the word here. It's not even king, it's captain. Over his people, like, you know. Go away, and I'll bring another one. So Samuel's verdict falls brutally upon Saul's head like a guillotine blade. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. That's the end of him. After his disinvestiture by God's prophet who had scouted and invested him, I remind you in the first place, Saul was clearly no longer fit to rule Yahweh's people. Everything went downhill for him ever since, starting with his senseless commands, unknowingly violated by his son Jonathan, and followed by the uh, military, uh, by the king decreeing his own son's death because he didn't follow 
his commands. That's crazy. And if there still were any doubt as to the sad fate of Saul, it was the Lord himself, Yahweh, that worked on dissipating it. His second disinvestiture was pronounced by Samuel. Skip all the technical details on the holy war, Heron, asked by God against the Amalekites, and disobeyed by, by commander-in-chief Saul. And go directly to the point. Samuel solemnly repeats three times to Saul that because he rejected the word of God, you know, the, the, the holy war command, God also rejected Saul from being king. And he crushed him by uttering that God ripped, that's the exact word, kingship off of you, to give it to a neighbor that is better than you. Wow. I mean, no king should ever <laughs> hear this kind of stuff, right? When, when, well, so the final act of spiritual and political annihilation of poor soul, the failed and contrite king, came with these terrible words spoken by God, his prophets here. Listen to this. It repenteth me. I have repented the God. God says that I have set up soul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and hath not performed my commandments. So, I mean... You have a situation where you have God's repentance for a choice of kingship made because God was carried away by sentimentality in his effort to tune with the people's cries and demand. And I mean, I think it's probably one of the most amazing pages in the whole Bible. Now, Saul is dead in the water, but he still is formally the king. He kept on reigning for many more chapters, but effectively the end of him was already, no, had already uh, taken place. Now God sets his eyes on David, this new kid in town, the new chosen one, and confided himself once again to Samuel, who, of course, always eager to help, right? As we saw, David, too, was the youngest of eight sons of Jesse, and he's also, he was shepherding sheep while his brothers were busy making war against the Philistines. He was too young, he was just, you know, with sheep. Once again, Samuel anoints an unknown youngster shielded from the sight of the people, just privately. Once again, God's spirit took hold for the anointed, David. Only now the Holy Spirit departed from, I remind you, the still practicing King Samuel, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled Saul. I mean, see, that's the thing with the spirit. As you know, the spirit blows where it wishes, and the spirit disregards established institutions, inheritances, successions, the continuity of the state. So David managed to acquire a big amount of legitimacy among the people by, of course, his continuous military exploits, starting with the one against Goliath the Philistine, great victory, and to cut a very long story, seven, centuries, seven chapters long story short, starts a paranoid persecution of the newly anointed David by a soul, paranoid soul, because Saul had started to envy his own military commander, David, after he intuitively understood that the young man would take his job because of God's reversal of the wheel of fortune. At the end of this killing spree, after the king's own guards refused to obey the souls, I mean, uh, order to execute the priests who had helped David in his flight from Saul, and even worse, the king's own son, Jonathan, whose life had been spared in the meantime, had concluded a pact with his very close friend, David, that David would rule and he would be his lieutenant, that uh, you know, uh, Jonathan would be the lieutenant of David. There was a final confrontation between the persecutor Saul and the persecuted David in the desert, where David had the chance to kill Saul surreptitiously in a cave, but refused to do so out of pure respect for the king anointed by God's prophet. And then Saul surrendered, taken by remorse, and he said to David, Thou art more righteous than I, for thou hast rewarded me good, whereas have, I have rewarded thee evil. And now, behold, he says, I know well that thou shalt surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in thine hand. And unfortunately, both Saul and all his three sons, including poor Jonathan, passed away by violent death at a military defeat by the Philistines at the end of this book. So the first unfit king's biological death just merely sealed his spiritual and political death that had already happened, pronounced by God. Now David, David's kingship, was very different from that of his predecessor, his failed predecessor, whom I remind you, of course, he had respected until the end, and had even decreed a nationwide mourning when he heard about his death uh, in the hands of the Philistines. David was a cautious person. While he had been picked out of God by God as charismatic and already anointed by Samuel, he was also confirmed and anointed again by the elders, and indeed twice, first by the men of Judah, his tribe, because he was, you know, the king, he became the king of the house of Judah, and then by all the elders of Israel, 
in Hebron, who anointed David king of Israel. So he had a sort of triple security. Nice. And the kingdom was established as a dual monarchy of Israel and Judah, something like the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Twice covenanted with the elders, David was bound by their traditions. Of course, had a, a reinforced legitimacy, also bound by their traditions, which means that the element of popular assent at the origin of kingship was even more pronounced for David. Now, though, a qualitative leap took place. Leap compared to the early and unhappy stages of the monarchy under Saul. And that is, of course, the establishment of the dynastic principle by yet another covenant, the Davidic covenant, expressed by another prophecy by another guy called Nathan, Prophet Nathan. Because David was so good and pleasant to Yahweh's heart, Yahweh grew soft on him once again, and he decided, I mean Yahweh, the Lord, that something, something truly path-breaking. I quote, nevertheless, for David's sake, did the Lord, his God, give him a lamp in Jerusalem, the famous lamp of Jerusalem, to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Just to say you that, tell to you that David had praised Yahweh in a psalm of thanksgiving, for thou art my lamp, O Lord, and the Lord will lighten my darkness, thus the lamp of, of Jerusalem. So therefore God distinguished this charismatic and raised as chosen, not only David himself, but all his progeny as well. So here and after, the succession of Israel's rulers would obey to the classical human principle of dynasties, of inherited continuity on the throne, on just one condition that David would build God a house to dwell, meaning the temple. Well, I mean, David was too occupied by, by wars, and, and Solomon did the job afterwards. Here are the crucial passages in the words of God to Nathan. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commit iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thine kingdom shall be established forever before thee. The throne shall be established forever. So this is a promise to last. And this is a seminal point in history marked by the prophecy of Nathan. And despite the scission of the kingdom in two after Solomon's death, well, we don't care why, the southern kingdom, Judah, there, the dynastic principle remained in force because, I remind you, Judah was David's house. Of course, the two books of kings are replete with palace coup in Judah, but the Davidic line of succession, hair after hair, remained uninterrupted until, of course, the unfortunate fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians in 797 B.C. Nevertheless, despite the firm hold of the Davidic covenant, even Judah's kings needed more, I would say, legitimacy inputs to be able to rule. Two more. First, the chosenness by God. Therefore, the renewal of the continent each and every time, at each and every succession. This is clearly the case with Solomon. It's God who chose Solomon as being the younger brother. That's first. And second... Of course, the support and fidelity of the legitimate heir by the people of the land. Quote, the people of the land, which happened also later on with an infant, Jehoash. Okay, let's give all this. Which means now that the word of God through one of his prophets, plus God's grace, plus the people's assent, was the equation for a successful succession, even in David's house of Judah, where the dynastic principle applied normally. Not to talk about the northern kingdom, Samaria, where the succession line of rulers remained charismatic as in the good old days of Israel before David. Even though the dynasty of Omri remained in place for some 40 odd years, and the dynasty of Jehu for almost a century because of the long reign of Jeroboam II, right after Jeroboam, poor Jeroboam's two death, six kings changed in a time lapse of 20 years, four of them unfortunately having been assassinated. So you see, now, the Davidic type of dynasty that managed to establish itself is, I would say, paradigmatic for the ambivalence of Israel towards the regular succession of its legitimate rulers to the throne of Yahweh. It's the throne is Yahweh's, right? It's a god, this world. Administered by one of the two earthly vicars, the king of Judah. I would call this indirect theocracy that came about by the new covenant, I mean the Davidic covenant, covenant, a covenant no longer between God and his people, as the first one in Moses, in, uh, by Moses, with Moses, I mean with the aid of Moses in Sinai, 
but between God and the house of David, almost unconditionally, mind you, with the exception of the obligation to construct the temple, what God promises now is less importantly peace and prosperity for God's chosen people until the end of time, until the Ashkata, than an endless succession of heirs for King David. I will quote the famous, you know, for the end, Royal Psalm 89 by Ethan, the chance. His seed, talking about David, shall endure forever, and his throne as the sun before me. It shall be established forever as the moon and as a faithful witness in heaven. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. Here we're verging on blasphemy. You could be lapidated to death back then in Israel by invoking the pagan cosmic symbols of the sun and the moon as tokens of eternity. What is going on here? It is as if the Davidic king here becomes the son of a heavenly father. It says, it's a son for me, just like his Egyptian or Babylonian colleagues. Whoa, that's not something that we were used to. Why? Because of this Nathan's prophecy, the assurance that even a very bad king would, of course, be chastised by God, but still would nonetheless have hairs of his own to whom God would be eternally committed, as long as, of course, he was David's heir. Well, this seemed to work out, this assurance, I mean, this Nathan prophecy thing, seemed to work out in favor of an unstable compromise and a growing normative tension looming in the background. As I tried to show all out throughout this lecture, Israel's God could never fully guarantee a regular succession of secular rulers. And indeed, I would say disruption is one of the main themes of the key words of the Bible itself, the Bible's historical books at least. On the other hand, the establishment of the Davidic dynasty reshuffled the, the deck by providing rulers with some long-awaited institutional security for their posterity, which of course would necessarily relax somewhat at least, the moral reflexes of the king in, I remind you, their sacred obligations, their missions towards the weak, the poor, widows, orphans, and so on, of the kingdom. I mean, if you're too sure of your, of your kingdom and your posterity, you kind of, you know, this is called, this is called moral hazard, by the way. Anyway, uh, you're not too eager to, you know, uh, to fulfill your sacred obligations. So the growing tension between these two concurring lines of cultural traditions would bring about, I think, and I will end with this, two major revolutions. The first one, which I have already presented, is the central normative conflict of Israeli monarchy, namely prophets versus kings. The rising up of the prophets as the voice of moral admonition originating from God as against royal immorality. Right? That's the first. So the kings would never be left alone to rule without always feeling, I would say, the hot and furious breath of the prophets, these religious demagogues, as Max Weber called them, and their incitement towards them and the people to repent, repent. And the second uh, uh, solution to this growing normative tension was, of course, the historical proof that monarchy would never really take hold of the hearts and souls of Israel because, I mean, if you see it retrospectively, with the sole exception of David, Solomon, and a couple only of other pious kings, Israeli kingship remained, I will be forgiven the expression, all in all, nasty, brutish, and short, as uh, you know the expression, I suppose, by Thomas Hobbes. In other words, it remained anomalous in the succession of its representatives, shallow in the interior because of the strong cultural resistance of the prophets in the name of eschatology, and short, if seen in the perspective of the very long history of Israel, it was just four centuries and a half thing, spiritually fertile also, you know, life of Israel, and astonishingly efficient life of Israel, of the sons and daughters of Abraham. Now, I come to my end. I had, sadly, to discard many fascinating stories I had prepared for Europe and fitness to rule, which are scattered across the historical books of the Bible, due, of course, to time constraints. There is a rebellion against David by his son Absalom, that was one of the most wonderful stories, his inglorious death, conspiracy against David by the wicked Sheba, the anomalous succession of David by Solomon instead of Adonia, who was, you know, the elder, the rebellion of the first Jeroboam against the legitimate heir of Solomon, Rehoboam, the dismemberment of Israel in Judah is prophetized by two prophets because, why? Because, because of the conscription, the heavy taxation that was ordered by Solomon for the construction of the temple and was not likened by Rehoboam, the prophecy of Jehu that King Baasha and his house will be destroyed and they were actually destroyed, the prophet Elijah, 
a censor of King Ahab and her demonic wife Jezebel, many more stories, generally served with a lot of bloodshed. Instead of ketchup, of course. I can also promise that I can only promise that this full diary will be developed in the publication to come. If I'm allowed, this is my minuscule and purely academic eschatological promise to you. Now, let just let me say one word to conclude. Sort of wrap this whole thing up by periodically reminding the rulers that no throne is stable enough when God freely decides to produce a new political and legal order via the emanation of a novel force, like David, for example, initially considered as undignified. Yahwehism, I mean, the belief in Yahweh, establishes itself as, I would say, an amicable rival of the sovereign king rulers. It's always there as a rival. In some, the biblical hermeneutics of disruption call for the exercise of civil government under a constant normative tension. The dissonance between political power and divine grace, uh, as expressed by the word of prophets, is a road sign for governance in accordance with the divine commands of love, piety, and charity towards the weak. These love, piety, and charity are the only possible assurances of leaders for not falling from grace. That's the only policy insurance, if you may be allowed. Ruling under these divine precepts externalizes political power. In other words, ensures the exercise of power for the people and not for the sake of self-preservation and self-aggrandizement in office. Ex externalizes power. So this surpassing of oneself as a ruler is, this is the last paradox. It's also a paradox, even though a positive one. By taking seriously the Israelite religion's moral warnings and therefore by taking care of others, the weak in his dominion, the king reinforces his own political legitimacy, even though, in the end, he must never feel reassured, since reversal of fortune by Yahweh might always occur. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor. Are there any questions? It was so crushing, right? I mean, you know, the whole thing. So, <laughs> you're so <Mace>? fearful. <laughs> uh, I would have a question about context of uh, So you produce a wonderful narrative, uh, which is, I think, very consistent. Um, but uh, I'm thinking about the many times I've been to conferences where the Hebrew Bible and so on has been discussed, and. Uh, the consensus, but I'm not a, a biblical scholar, the consensus is that the majority of the books of the Bible took form in the post-Persian period. Uh, and so this is a... Hmm? Uh, well, it comes to the same thing, I think. <laughs> uh, although there are more radical people who would date it, date it later still. Uh, but be that as it may, this is therefore all a retrospective construction. So what you're you're giving us is something that is idealized uh, and um, how this could work in relation to any historical reality is a very open question. Uh, so I, I'd be actually in your response to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. I actually had this discussion with my son before, before uh, coming here. She asked me a little bit, the, I mean, more or less the same question. I mean, what is the historical truth in all this? Well, I mean, there's a straightforward answer here is we don't know because there has been a lot of suppression of sources by the compilators of the Bible. I mean, the Bible is a second-hand literature. It's a second-order, I would say, literature. So, unfortunately, I mean, we all lament this. There's a book of lamentation. <laughs> and, okay, I'm just joking, of course. Uh, we all lament this, but all this comes down to the... Uh, the narratives that have avoided slaughter by the compilators. And what was the principal motive for the compilators in their discarding or eliminating many historical sources? Well, it's kind of simple. The Bible, is, as I said in the very beginning, is agnostic on politics. The Bible doesn't care about politics. There's no theory in the Bible. There's no political theory. Or in general, there's no theory. Okay, The only thing that the Bible cares about is, of course, God. 
and of course the history of salvation and the eschatological promise of salvation. So all the historical narratives that can fit with this guiding principle, right? This idée force, as you say in French, this you know the idea that is the forceful idea that drags the whole you know the 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 the, the train uh, will fit into the Bible, and the rest will not. So yes, of course. I mean, the Deuteronomy itself, if you go down to a specialist's talk, the Deuteronomy is just a retrospective reinterpretation of the first historical books of Samuel and Kings. It's a second order, third order, I would say, <laughs> reinterpretation. That's it. So, I mean, the whole question about what really happened in Israel didn't happen is totally vain and has no place in the whole debate. There's no point in debating it because Israel is all about the history of God with his people. That's all. Of course, there are many other, luckily, sources such as Stelly, such as the, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the um, the, uh, the, the, the the famous desert, you know, manuscripts and, uh, you know, all the, okay, these are, but th there's a problem with these sources. I'm not historian, right? Just um, be very careful here. But there's a problem here, that all these sources are external sources to the Hebrew culture. So we might take them with a pinch of salt, because these are not sources that relate things or narratives from the rain side. Of course, that doesn't make them less legitimate or less authoritative, but still, these are not Hebrew sources. I mean, yeah, okay, some of them are, but the great stuff of sources is in the Bible. It's like there are like more than 2,000 pages of the Bible. And, yeah, of course, I mean, the idealized, not by me, but the Bible by Bible itself, if you call that idealized. It's not really idealized. It's God-like. There's a tropism of, of, you know, to Yahweh. The, all the rest is not I'll just give you an example, if I may. In the whole two books of Kings here, which is, as I said, a, a, a bloodshed, actually. It's a gore movie. Uh, it is like, you know, how kings exterminated one another in their succession. Okay. Uh, there must be like 40 to 50 kings in the time span of like, you know, uh, four centuries. And I only could find two, as I said, a couple of these, or two of these kings that, we're actually doing the job, you know, fulfilling their mission of following God's law and being charitable and all that. All the rest, but really all the rest, there's a there's a recurring sentence that they, I mean, you know, they they didn't they didn't act on God's will. They violated God's will. And then, of course, all these are heavily criticized. So you see here that I, I don't know if that's true, but I mean, it's kind of improbable that this happened at such a great extent. It is that the second-hand compilation of these sources needs to be anti-monarchic, as I said, because the only true ruler is, is, is God. So everything happens under the shadow of God. This is nothing, I mean, there's nothing like that in any other people, in any other history, anywhere else. So you cannot just compare history with, it's, it's, it's a category by itself, right? <laughs> Because God plays no role such as this in other histories. Thank you. Any more questions? Yes. Yes, um, thank you for this uh, presentation. Uh, my question could be totally out of context, uh, if that's so, uh, warm it. so where does um, or uh, how does the uh, narrative of Messiah fall uh, between uh, the narrative of uh, prophets versus the kings? And how should it, I don't know, uh, or might it affect the theory of social contract? Thank you. Well, I, 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 one of the things that were left out was, was of course, the Davidic uh, messianism. The messianism is clearly being traced back to David's uh, David's legacy, right? And the thing about messianism is that it actually started, if I get this right, more or less in the exilic period in Babylonian, you know, captivity. Why? Because there was no state any longer, so there was no land either. So uh, Israel 
I mean, Israeli became Jews. The diaspora started then, then and there. And these people did not have anymore um, the assurance that they would become again a uh, political community with, you know, a dignified state. And so they were in deep existential, say, crisis. They didn't know what would happen, right? Now, because David's dynasty ended violently with the destruction of the temple by the Babylonians, you know, in 797, the, uh, but still the Nathan's prophecy held, I mean, the prophecy that David's throne will last forever. Like there was a kind of shift to an internalized, spiritualized kingdom, which was no longer the kingdom of true state. And this was sort of transposed into a metaphysical kind of sphere. And the Messiah is a product of this shift from the external conditions of the exercise of power to the internalized eschatological hope that there will come a day that some David, some, some hair of David will save us and lead us all to the kingdom of God in the eschata, right, in the, in the end. So Messianism is something that actually started quite late in uh, Israel's history. That's why it didn't relate at all here, but it's, of course, very important. And there are actually two branches of it. There's the uh, royal, as they say, you know, Messianism, and there's, there's a purely religious or eschatological Messianism. And of course, then comes Jesus Christ and his role and so on. But as to your question, all this is at the heart of, uh, I mean, the heyday, if you want, of the uh, history of Israel before the exile. And there you don't really have Messianism. You just have it because of, because of the destruction of the state and the temple. I don't know if I, you know, I make my sort of suit. Thank you. Any more questions? If not, oh, <laughs> Professor Baines again, uh, I, go ahead. Uh, just another comment. The, um, it's, uh, it's a sort of question. Uh, the characteristic that you give to kings um, uh, to do with charity and things of this sort, this is, of course, uh, a fairly universal characteristic of kings. Uh, I, mean, as I said that uh, for the, for example, the Egyptian king, is mm. more or less the same, I think. <laughs> much better than me. Uh, I've read it indirectly and from direct sources. Or the it's clear for the Babylonian king as well. They have to be charitable, you know, kind. But, I mean, in their case, it's just noblesse oblige, as I said. It, it, it comes as a package with aristocracy, with noblesse. Here it's not this. It is radically democratized. I talked about moral democracy. It is a moral obligation by the covenantal, you know, tradition, by God's law. And the king is just one of them who has to fulfill this same promise, only, of course, the king has also responsibility towards his community. So it is the same thing, yes, of course, but not for the same reasons and doesn't carry the same, I would say, moral force. Here it carries the maximum of moral force. <laughs> it's God himself who has, you know. I think one, one could argue that, that you're being limited in relation to other traditions, but uh, it's too complicated, so it's not Probably, yes, yes, probably, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm too skewed to my Hebrew friends here, so, you know, I can, I can, I can accept this, of course. Thank you. If there aren't any more questions, let us thank Professor Papadopoulos once again. We'll take a short break. We're almost on time. I can't believe it. And at 4.30, we continue with our last session for today.